Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for joining us virtually and in person today. My name is Lindsay Sullivan. I am the Technical Marketing Manager at CCS America. Um, I was an application engineer with them for a few years before that, about five, so I know what I'm talking about even though I say I'm in marketing. I do know these techniques. Um, today we're going to be talking about machine vision techniques. I'm going to touch on a little bit about LEDs, a little bit about lensing and lighting and cameras. Um, so hopefully by the end of this you get a really good just overall knowledge of, you know, best way to start an application and the idea of lighting techniques other than just if it's a scratch on an application, I need a low angle light. I'm not, the presentation isn't really application based. It's kind of like the physics of lighting. So when you're doing your application testing, you're thinking about how the light is reflecting off your sample, what light are we trying to capture and thinking of it from that point of view. And then that can help you kind of take your lighting experience to the next level. Uh, a little bit about CCS America. There we go. Um, we, you know, we, we offer a lot of things as a as a service. We have application discussions. If you are struggling with an application and you've kind of tried a lot of things, feel free to give us a call and you can talk to one of our application engineers. They can kind of just bounce ideas back and forth and say, hey, maybe start with this light or if you've tried this and this, we've had this happen in the past kind of a nice way to just kind of get the juices flowing a little bit more if you get a little bit stuck. We do free application testing. So if you're really like, I am so burnt out, I don't know what to do, you can send your sample to us and we'll test it in our lab. We'll make a report. We'll say, here's what we've solved. You know, we, this light, this setup, this color, and then you can kind of solve your application and stop banging your head against the wall. That happens a lot with um, tough applications. Uh, we also do free demo loans. If you do you know, I'm really confident a red coaxial, it will work, but we don't have a red coaxial light. Can I just borrow one for 30 days? We'll give that to you free of charge. Um, technical assistance, if anything, you know, just kind of isn't really working like you thought it would, give us a call. We'll help walk you through it. And then trainings like this, you know, you want to teach your internal team, you want to teach your own customers or, you know, whatever you guys have. We like to help you help yourself. So we do perform trainings like this kind of as needed. Um, CCS is kind of like a, there's a CCS group, we have a little partnership, so there's CCS America, but we also work with Effilux, which is a lighting company out of France, they do more kind of flood lighting type applications, I'll talk about their products a little bit throughout the presentation, um, but it's not very product focused, so if you do want to, um, you know, get more information about any of these companies, please reach out to um, uh, Mechatronic after, after this presentation, and then Gardasoft as well, they do machine vision lighting controllers, really useful if you need to overdrive your light for just a little bit more intensity, stuff like that. So you can get any of these three products through CCS. Um, to start a little bit, um, LED properties, why do we use LEDs? Uh, they have a high degree of freedom because they're easier to customize and direct the light. There's a lot of range of formats available. You can do ring, bar, coaxial. So there's a lot that we can do with LED lights at a lower cost than we used to do before they were invented. They last longer, they have a much faster response, they're much lower cost, and they're getting even more and more color flexible. Before it was kind of just red and green that we had, and then the blue blue light was invented, which led to better lights, and now we're getting full color. It's really getting, getting impressive, the wavelengths we're able to do with LED lightings. Um, LED lifetime, when you buy a light, you wanna know how long is my light going to last? Uh, we call this by essentially the number of hours it takes for your light to go from 100% intensity down to about 70% intensity or 50% intensity. So how, how many hours does it take for your light to eventually drop off over time? And that happens with any LED. It's gonna be a CCS LED, a competitor's LEDs, all LEDs have some type of lifetime. So it's just the number of hours it takes for the light to eventually dim to where it's no longer essentially usable. Um, for CCS, for about 50% from 100% um, intensity, it's about 30,000 to 50,000 hours until you get to about 50% intensity, and we recommend uh, replacing the light if it's not working for you. We also recommend that you start your light intensities at 80%, and that way, as eventually over time, you know, 30 hours come up, your light's decreased a little bit, you can just up your intensity of the light and go back to the original intensity you had, and you can kind of extend that lifetime before you have to replace your light by um, just kind of starting at a lower intensity and giving yourself that little buffer there. Um, one thing about kind of how LEDs um, work is the amount of time that they're on is what's kind of taking the hours away. So leaving your light on continuously as your machine goes through 
will make your light last much shorter than if you only flash your light during the exposure of the camera. So um, that's kind of one way to extend your lifetime as well of your LEDs, to strobe it with your camera. Other factors that can affect the LED lifetime is uh, heat, high internal temperature. So your ambient environment, if, there's, if it's too hot in there, there's too much moisture, um, something like that, that can really make it hard on the LEDs and they'll burn out faster. Um, we do have cooling mechanisms. There's heat sinks built into our lights and some lights even come with fans to make sure that they don't overheat if they're extremely bright. Or if you're making a custom light that's gonna be really bright, we'll have a fan on it. So there are ways to kind of make it not as much of a problem, um, but also when you're mounting the light, make sure the bracket that you're using is a good heat sink, and so it can pull the heat away from the light, and then that will help as well your light not get so hot. Next, talking about powering LEDs, there are a few ways that you can do it. There's voltage controllers and current controllers. CCS controllers like the PD3, PD4, all that, those are going to be voltage-driven controllers, and they're driven with what we call pulse width modulation, and that's where the light flickers at extremely high intensity where it's continuous for all intents and purposes, but it's actually flickering. The pro of that is that it's a linear, um, a linear intensity, so if I'm at 255 and I bring it down to 100, it's about 50% as intense, versus if you do something like analog voltage control, then you get, um, you know, you drop your light 50% or if you go from 10 volts to 5 volts, you won't necessarily drop 50% intensity, it might be a little bit more. So you have more control with pulse width modulation. Um, current controllers, which are Gardasoft controllers, they, so they control the intensity of everything by adjusting the current. Those controllers are great for overdriving and having a lot of um, high speed applications, stuff like that. So there's webinars we have kind of that focus on this topic, especially to kind of know when to use each type of controller. I will say most applications, you can kind of just use whatever interface you like. If you want to use the GUI on Gardasoft or you prefer the dial-up or Ethernet version of the CCS, it's not typically that critical um, unless you're doing high-speed overdriving, line scan, something like that. Um, you can also plug 24 volts directly into the LEDs. That's going to wear them out the easiest and the fastest. You have no control, so we don't really recommend it, but technically it's possible. You can do what you want to do. Um, there are also different lighting methods. So there is continuous, and that is where the light turns on and stays on until the light turns off and you just have your exposure within those, um, within that time. There's also strobing, and that is where the light flashes in synchronization with the camera. There are a few different terms that kind of do it, and it's all kind of about the triggering. So if it says pulsed or switched, that means the light is on for a specified amount of time. So when a trigger comes in, my light turns on for 50 milliseconds and turns off. And then it turns back on when another trigger comes in for 50 milliseconds and turns off. If it says on off mode or, um, oh, what's the other one? I think it's just on off mode. Um, then it's based on the input signal. So you'll have your signal for like PNP, your signal will be low. And if I turn my signal up high, the light will be on as long as I keep my signal high. When I drop my signal, the light turns off. So it can be on for 50 milliseconds and then off and then on for 20 and off. So you have more control of when the light is on as long as you can control the signal that you're sending to the controller. So that's what the kind of different methods are um, between your standard 100% intensity and then overdriving, I've mentioned a few times, is where you apply higher current to the light for a shorter duration. So if I'm at 100% intensity for 50 milliseconds, but I need my exposure time to be more like 10 milliseconds, I would put my light at 500% intensity for 10 milliseconds instead of 100% at 50 milliseconds kind of thing. So you can make your light significantly brighter, but it has to be done for a short amount of time, and you have to give your LED time to rest after that as well. Um, so if you ever have an application where you're like, I just need a little bit more light, just work on, think about overdriving the light to get a little bit more intensity for yourself. Um, just a little bit about the different kinds of LEDs we have. There's the dip type and the chip type. Um, the shape is different, but really the structure is the same. And kind of the biggest difference between um, what happens is the radiation angle. So a dip type will have a narrow or wide version, um, but it's typically, um, and then a chip type is mostly wide angle. So you'll see for like our LDL2s, there'll be like the LDL2 part number, and then it'll be like dash W. So that means it's the wide angle version. Um, 
turn my laser pointer on. So that's the the wide angle version here. But if it doesn't have the dash W, then it's going to be having a little bit more of an, a narrow output. And you can see uh, the kind of this is the radiation angle of the different different types. So wide and chip are very similar. Narrow and wide are much different. Okay. That's all I have for LEDs, kind of just a base of why we use what we use and little tips and tricks to make your LED work a little bit longer and a little bit better. Um, next, I'm going to touch on lensing topics. This is not a full lensing presentation. I'm kind of just giving you the basics of what you need to know. Sometimes it, your applications require more knowledge than this. When that happens, reach out to not a lighting company <laughs> anybody else. But I'll give you kind of a little bit of just the overview of lighting or of lensing. So there are three types. There's the fixed focal length lens, a macro lens, and a telecentric lens. Um, when it comes to the fixed focal length, your field of view and your working distance is adjustable. So you can bring your focal length down, you can adjust your focus and get adjust your field, your field of view, your light working distance, as long as you're within the range of the lens, the lens specifications. With a macro lens or a telecentric lens, it's going to have a fixed focus point. So in the specifications, it's going to say what the focus distance is, the light working distance is going to be set at maybe 200 millimeters or something like that. So you don't have as much flexibility and they tend to be a smaller field of view, but you have a much little, a, a lot less distortion and higher accuracy than smaller field of view. So they all have a time and place um, when they're best to use. The difference between macro and telecentric, the macro lens are going to be a little bit more bright because they don't have as much of the parallelism that a telecentric lens has, which I'll talk about a little bit in the next um, slide. They'll still have a high resolving power, but they will have a very shallow depth of field. Um, a depth of field is how much of your um, image is in focus in the Z range. So if it's too close to my lens, it's going to be out of focus. If it's too far away, it's going to be in focus. But there's a little bit here where I can move it about that it'll still be in focus. So out of focus, in focus, out of focus. This is what we call our depth of field. Um, for telecentric, you're going to have a lot less intensity, but it does maintain a constant viewing angle. So what I mean by that is you can, if you look at, you know, something on a pitch from above, when you have a telecentric lens, you're just going to see the top of the pitch versus a focal length or a macro lens, you can see down that pitch a little bit. So this is, I'll get into applications where you're going to want one or the other, and it'll be more important um, about, you know, which option we go with. Um, the reason you have the parallel, um, the parallelism of a telecentric lens versus a conventional lens is the way the light comes in. You've got a big lens right here. It makes it come into the lens more of in a parallel straight down direction. And what that means is with telecentric lenses, they have to be as big as the field of view. So if your field of view is this big, your telecentric lens has to also be this big. So they can get very big and very expensive very quickly. But they're very unique and powerful with the fact that you can look straight down on an image with very little distortion or looking down the sides of your sample. Um, there are some very impressive telecentric lenses out there from lensing companies that I think would be a lot of fun to play with. <laughs> um, for focal length, when you talk about focal length, the you're going to get like there's an f8, an f12, f16, f50, f75. And that is going to change the viewing angle of your object. So if it's longer, longer focal length, your viewing angle is much smaller. And then if it's shorter, you know, you get a wide viewing angle. So what you kind of can see happens is an image like this. I have, I can use that. I have um, maintained the working distance uh, or the light working distance of my camera but I'm changing the focal length. So if I have a short focal length, 2.8 millimeters, I have the whole field of view of seeing this woman standing in a city. And as I move my focal length from 2.8 all the way to 50, I'm just zooming in more and more and more on this person. So what we utilize this for is if I have a specific, I need to be this far away, but I have to have this field of view, you get a focal length that matches that. Versus, um, you know, if it's not a problem, you wanna just, you just keep in mind that the further you get away, the longer your working distance has to be and the smaller your field of view will be. Another time that this can come into play is using um, short and long focal lengths when just solving applications. So this is, um, I think, bullets and a tray. And if we had a short focal length, like the F16, we can see down all of these 
bullets, but we can't really see the tops very well, except for really in the middle is our best angle. But if we move all the way to an F50 and increase our working distance to 200 millimeters, now we're looking at more of the tops of each one of these and our application is a lot easier to solve. So this is a situation where lighting had nothing to do with it, but picking the right lens will improve our ability to solve the application um, in, in one way. The next way um, is kind of if you're looking down like a cup or something like that, now we want that wide, that wide viewing angle so we can look up the edges of the cup versus if we have that longer F25, we can't see the edges of the cup so we can't see the foreign material or the defect that's um, appearing right here. So they really can improve or it, it can help or hurt your image if you pick the right or wrong focal length. Um, there is a way to calculate what kind of lens you need. Um, the focal length, essentially the ratio, the field of view to the sensor size is the same equals the working distance to the focal length. So we can solve this by saying the sensor size times the working distance divided by the field of view will tell us what focal length we need. So an example of this, if we have 800 millimeters working distance, we know that there's a restriction. We know our field of view has to be 200 millimeters. We picked out our camera, so we looked up the sensor size spec in their spec sheet. We know what our sensor size is. Um, what is our focal length? Doing our calculations, it's about 35.2 millimeters. So we can pick a 35 millimeter um, lens, have a slightly bigger field of view because it's not perfectly 35. So we might have to do a little bit, you know, 233 millimeters or slightly bigger field of view, but at least it gives you the close range of what focal length do I want, um, do I need for my application. Sometimes you'll see a lens table and all this is, is you just look up the graph. So if you have a two thirds inch sensor, 300 millimeter working distance and um, 175 millimeter field of view, then you can just go in the table and figure out that you need a 16 millimeter lens. So that's just how those, those tables work. Uh, next thing to talk about lenses is the aperture. So if you have an F2, um, a capital F2, not lowercase F2, I know how fun that is and how super clear it is, but the more aperture, the more open your aperture is, the more light you're letting into your lens. As you close it, you're limiting the brightness and um, you know, you're making your image more dark. What we, the trade-off between these is the intensity and the field of view. So if you have your aperture very open, you will have more light, but your field of view is much smaller versus if you close your aperture, you have a much bigger field of view, but you give off the, um, you give off intensity and the resolution will decrease a little bit as well. So there's a, a trade off either way, really go with what's best for your application. I would say more often than not, I tend to turn up the light on my, I turn up my light more and close my aperture unless you're working with the LFX V. That's the only time that I'll ever make sure my aperture is fully open based on how that light works. There are aberrations that come with lenses, distortions, there's lots of axial chromatic colors. I'm not gonna touch on all of these, but I'll touch on two. Um, one is distortion. You can create a barrel or a pin cushion. So that'll be a spec within the lens is the distortion of it. You want a lower distortion level and that will mean that there's less of this having an impact on your lens or on your image. But the one that we kind of come across the most as a lighting company is the axial, axial chromatic aberration. And what this means essentially is different wavelengths have a different focus um, point. So if I were to use a blue light, it focuses at about 20, you know, five, six, seven, or no, maybe, what's that? Eight, so maybe like 18. But when I turn my red light on, it focuses more at 25. So if you're ever like solving an application and you are going between red and blue and you notice you have to keep adjusting your focus level, that's just part of the lenses and the wavelength of light. Um, extras you can get, you can get rear converter lens or extension tubes to help um, make the field of view work within your required working distance, stuff like that. Not gonna touch on that. Okay, that's kind of super quick overview for lenses. Um, next we have optical techniques for cameras. So oh, there are four things to consider when you're doing your camera, and that's the sensor, the pixel size, the pixel size and the resolution of your camera, the focal length, and the depth of field. So I touched a little bit on what the depth of field is, but this kind of image is gonna give us a better idea of what we're looking at. So the field of view is the viewable area of the object under inspection. 
So when someone says your field of view, you can say the size of your sample, but really you're going to give a little bit, an inch on one side, an inch on the other for tolerance. So your field of view is bigger than the size of your sample. Um, but it's just what the camera is looking at. The working distance is the distance from the bottom of the lens to the sample. Um, the resolution is the minimum feature size of the object that can be distinguished by the image system. And I'll touch on that and make that a little bit more clear in a few slides. Um, the depth of field is the maximum object depth that can be maintained entirely, entirely in focus. So that was out of focus, in focus, out of focus. Um, the sensor size is um, the camera's sensor active area. So it's essentially how the camera is taking your picture is that with that sensor. It's a spec that you can find in the camera itself. And then the focal length, we just kind of had a big spiel about um, the distance between the lens and the image sensor. And then the magnification of the lens, the ratio between the sensor size and the field of view. There are two kinds of cameras that you can get. There are area scan cameras and line scan cameras. Um, the difference between the two is how they're taking the picture. So the area scan camera is going to be an X number of pixels by Y number of pixels, and it's always going to be that size and it's unchangeable. But when you take a picture, you get that whole image in one snapshot, that whole square or rectangle. Versus the line scan camera, it kind of builds the image one line at a time. So you have one pixel by 2,000 pixels, 8,000 pixels, however many, whatever resolution your line scan camera is, and you kind of build it like a loaf of bread. So every slice is the one line that you're taking, and when you put all the slices together, you create a loaf, and that's your image. Um, the pro of an area scan versus a line scan camera is you can get a significantly higher resolution image by um, using a line scan camera versus an area scan. They have, you know, 21 megapixel cameras these days, but with a line scan, this can be a 75 megapixel image. So the um, downside to line scan, the object has to be moving. Otherwise, you'll just get one line by 8,000. So if your object isn't moving, line scan is out. But um, it can be a really useful technology as well um, as area, area scan. There, in area scan, there are two different kinds of shutters. There's a rolling shutter and a global shutter. A rolling shutter works kind of like a line scan camera where it kind of takes a picture as it rolls down the resolution versus a global shutter just takes a picture of the whole thing at once in one snapshot. What you really need to know is if your object is stationary, then it's okay to use a rolling shutter, but if your object is moving, then you really can't use a rolling shutter because your image will look like this. As the propeller moves, your image is gonna scroll down and your propeller is gonna be in a different place as your, um, as your shutter scrolls down. So, you know, global tends to be a little bit more cost effective than, or rolling is more cost effective than global, so that tends to be why people use it, but if you have anything moving, you're gonna wanna go with a global shutter. Um, your area, their cameras will come with a sensor size. So all of your sensors will say like two thirds inch sensor size means that the X and Y is about 8.8 .8 millimeters by 6.6 .6 and the diagonal is 11. Um, the reason you need to know this is you need to make sure that the sensor size lines up with your lens. So you need to make sure that the lens you buy fits with the sensor size of your camera. And if it fits and it's good, then you don't have any, um, the image circle from the lens does not interfere with the sensor size of the camera. And if it's bigger, that's okay too. But if it's smaller, so I have a lens that's about one inch sensor size, but I have a sensor, a sensor size of my camera that's, um, bigger than, or that's um, bigger than that, we get what we call vignetting. And that's where we have dark, it kind of looks like you're not gonna have enough intensity. Um, a lot of times people come and they think that the light isn't big enough, they're not getting a uniform image. And instead of, it's not necessarily a lighting issue, it's that your sensor size of your lens does not match your camera. Um, so, you know, just make sure when you're picking, when you're specking your objects, specking out your cameras and stuff, that you're paying attention to that. Um, Cameras will also have peak wavelengths. So monochrome camera, this will just be one wavelength, but it's essentially their responsiveness at a certain wavelength. So with this specific camera here, if you use a red light, you're gonna have the highest response. It's gonna be the brightest light that that camera can see. But if you go down to like an IR light, you're only at about 10% response. So you're gonna need a lot more light to get the same intensity of the image. Um, most of the time, this doesn't come up. Honestly, it's usually there's enough light to kind of have enough flexibility, but if you're using an IR light or one of those longer wavelengths and you're just not getting enough light, maybe try finding a camera that has a little bit more response at the later wavelengths, something like that. 
Um, and then color cameras have the same responses as um, red, green, and blue. Um, what kind of the point of this bit is to talk about these formulas. So these formulas are how we can decide what size camera we need based on the defect size that we need to see. Um, so we can use this to calculate the um, resolution required essentially. So there's two formulas, one factors in motion and one kind of doesn't factor in motion. I usually start with the no motion one because it's easier to get what you need to do. So you have your resolving power, which when, when I was going through the definitions and I said the resolution is the smallest defect your camera can see, that's what the resolving power of your camera is. It is the um, smallest defect size divided by the pixels per defect. So for example, well, I'll get to an example in a second. And then you have, um, you take your resolving power, your field of view div divided by your resolving power gets you the, um, sorry, your field of view divided by your image resolution gets you your resolving power. And then you can create, calculate your magnification as well. Um, this one factors in the exposure time, but it uses the speed of the part, the exposure time of your camera, the blur of your camera, the one pixel, and then the field of view. So going into an example, let's say we're looking at this barcode and we need to read that OCR code above the barcode. We know that OCR code is two millimeters high in the X direction. And so um, we know that the field of view is 153 millimeters. The code we want to read, the smallest image that we want to read is tw um, two millimeters. The speed's about 90 feet per minute, 460 millimeters a second. Um, and you know the other things aren't as important. So what we do is we do two millimeters. The rule of thumb when you're reading OCR is you want at least 30 pixels in the whatever the tallest direction is. So two millimeters divided by 30 pixels, we have a resolving power of 0 0.067 millimeters per pixel. If we take our field of view and divide it by that number, we know we need at least 2,284 pixels to have that field of view, but that resolving power across the whole field of view. So then that tells us we need at least a five megapixel camera. So this is the minimum that we need. Obviously you can go above it, but this is what you have to have. Um, so that can tell us, just that calculation alone can tell us what minimum camera we need. And then um, you can calculate your exposure time based off of what, what camera you just picked. So you do one millimeter um, is the blur. So typically you can do 0.9 if you're trying to be safe, but one is how many pixels are gonna be blurred in your image. Um, one is a safe bet, 0.9 is even safer. Don't really go above one unless you're doing sub-pixel processing. But um, the blur times your field of view and then divided by the speed that we were given and our resolution that we calculated, which comes down to about 128 microseconds. So we're really gonna have to overdrive this light to get to that speed. So we can kind of solve a lot of our application by just doing a little bit of math ahead of time. Okay, that is all I have for cameras and lenses. So now we get to what I know best, which is lighting techniques. So before we start, I'm gonna talk about the relationship between light and an object. Light will come down from a source and it will hit a surface. And there's four things that kind of happen to the light once it hits the surface. It can reflect and bounce off the surface and go in a direction. It can scatter, so it bounces off the surface and reflects in every direction, so it scatters away. Um, it can absorb and change to heat, and then it can transmit and pass through completely unchanged. Uh, in most scenarios, you have kind of a combination of this happening. Light will reflect or scatter or do a little bit of both and might absorb, you can't really see it. Might pass through, you can't really see that either, but um, what we wanna do is pay attention to how the light is reflecting off of our samples. So I'll kind of use these reflection techniques um, as we go around, as we go through the presentation. Um, I'm gonna break up light and talk about what we have into four properties. There's the direction of the light, so how it's coming out um, from the, the direction of the wavelength as it's coming out of the light, you know, the machine vision light we have, the wavelength itself, so how long that wavelength is, the amplitude, how tall that wavelength is, and then the polarization is kind of like the direction, but it's like the radial direction of it. Um, also, there are four different kinds of, or not four, eight different kinds of really machine vision lights that 
if you look at our catalog, it's, you know, this thick, there's so many different kinds of lights and different profiles, but really most of them can be broken down into these eight categories. They just kind of have slight differences between them. So there's ring lights, backlights, bar lights, dome lights, coaxial, low angle, kind of a flat ring light and a flat dome light. So that kind of encompasses really our whole catalog. It's just different variations of these types of profiles. Okay, so starting with the direction, we talk about bright field and dark field illumination. So when we have light reflecting off of our sample, a direct reflection is where the light shines down, hits our sample, and is reflected away at the same angle at which it hit the sample. So we call that a direct reflection. Versus scattered light is kind of what I talked about, meaning the light shines down, and yeah, it scatters out in that direction, but it also scatters out in every direction. So when the light comes down, it's not necessarily just the one and one, it's one and then everything. So when we see that in our machine vision applications, um, it's important to know which type of light we're capturing. So if I have this image here, which one of these images is the, is the direct reflection in relation to the camera? So what area on, on this um, picture is direct reflection? Usually there's more people and I kind of pick on it, but since there's only four of you, I won't make you guys answer these unless you want to. Nope, that's direct reflection exactly. So that light is coming down, it's hitting that sample, and all of that light is going reflected directly into our camera. Versus diffuse reflection is everything else. Where that light is coming down, it's reflecting light, we can see it, because if it wasn't reflecting any light, we couldn't see it at all. So it is reflecting some light, it's just not that direct reflection of the camera, it's scattering it, so it's appearing more even and more uniform. So kind of the relationship between direct light and diffuse light, the light angle. So if I have my sample here, and I have a light shining down and a camera shining down, if I am, this is a very reflective sample, and I have that direct light, and I have my light shine down, hit my sample, and go up into my camera, I'm capturing all that direct ref reflection. If I move my light, but I don't move my camera, this light is now going to reflect, and it's not going to enter my camera. It's going to reflect away from it because I changed that angle. So when you're dealing with your direct light, the angle of the light versus the angle of the camera is very important. However, the distance, if I'm capturing all that direct reflection, if I get closer and further away, it's going to get more intense as I get closer, but it's since you're capturing so much of that light already, it's not going to be that noticeable. So really the distance of your light isn't as critical as the angle of your light. Versus if you have the scattered light that you're capturing, the light shines down, it ends up in any direction anyway. I can put my camera anywhere and still capture the same amount of light in any location, but the closer I get to my sample, the more intense my image is going to get when it bounces off and goes into my camera. So direct light, angle matters, scattered light, distance matters. Really what you need to know. Okay, a few more quiz questions coming up for you guys. Let's say I have this set up, and I've got a ring light shining down and a camera looking at the side taking a picture, and this is the picture my camera is taking. If I turn the lights off and turn my light on, I get an image that looks like this. So I kind of, question one, where's the camera? Kind of to explain it. It's shining down, it's off to the side looking. Question two, what happens if I put a mirror underneath that light. What's gonna what's the mirror gonna look like? Let me know. Uh, you're right. It shines all the light up because of, but because our camera's over here, we're not capturing that light, so it's appearing dark. So you know if you were gonna look straight down it would be bright, but we're over here we're not capturing that light. What happens if I move the mirror to that spot? Correct, that's when you get that direct reflection. So that's where that exact angle of light is shining down and hitting directly at that same angle back up into my camera. So I can see perfectly the mirror reflection of that light. So then what happens if I put paper over the whole table? Before it was a glossy table, had a fair amount of reflection. Now I put diffuse paper over it. How will my image change? It will remove, sorry, <laughs> I can let you answer if you want. Yeah, exactly. It will remove the hot spot and get more even. It becomes more diffusive. And so kind of a little bit more example of that here. If you have a desk that's kind of shiny, kind of bright, 
you have definitely a hot spot where the light is shining down. In this picture here, light shining down, reflecting up into the camera. But there still is some diffusive moments and you know diffusive properties um, around the desk, but it's not an extremely uniform image. Versus a mirror, which is only reflective, you'll see the perfect outline of the light, but you won't see any other light in the um, outside of that because it's not diffusing any light. And then paper, which is extremely diffusive, the light shines down, it's diffusing everywhere, you get a very uniform image. Um, why this is important um, for us to know, essentially, and have to have these ideas, is when I ask you how reflective is your material, is it is it, is it a matte surface, is it diffusive, is it, I'm asking because I need to know what size of light I'm recommending to you. If you tell me that you have a field of view that's this big and it's a mirror, I have to give you, I have to recommend a light that's about two times the field of view so I can have that angle um, from the light and match that outer edge of the mirror and reflect into the camera. Typically that's about twice the size. Versus if your sample's this big, but it's something like paper or really diffusive, I don't have to have a light that's two times the field of view. I can have a much smaller light. So knowing how reflective your sample is affects how large of a light you, you use to get a uniform image um, across the whole thing. So um, kind of circling back, we have this is the ring light. What do we call the scattered light and what do we call the direct light? So the direct light is where we saw that ring light image and then the scattered light is kind of all other light that we see. So how do we use, you know, I just talked about a bunch of reflection properties, like what does that, how does that translate to solving applications? And it comes into solving bright field and dark field images. So a bright field image is where we're capturing all of that direct reflection and that's what we want to see to create a bright background and then make the defects appear dark. So what's happening in this image right here is all of this light is reflecting off of this metal sample and going into the camera. But where I have the embossed words, that light isn't reflecting, it's scattering. So less light is reaching the camera, therefore not enough light is reaching the camera, it's appearing dark. So we're highlighting the top surface but making all the defects appear, appear dark because they're just scattering the light and that we're capturing that direct reflection. The other scenario is if you, instead of capturing that direct light, we move our camera to just capture that shattered light. So now we have that direct light bouncing off our surface and it's missing our camera completely. We're not capturing it, but we're capturing the scattered light from our defects. So those are appearing white while the background appears dark. So when you're solving your applications, you kind of want to think about, you know, I have this defect I want to see. Do I want to capture, do I want, is the light scattering off this defect? Um, is that what I want to capture? Or do I want to not see the scattered light and I want to capture the direct reflection light? So that's kind of, where I want you to take these principles as I talk to them is how do I think about it when I solve my applications. Just another example here is um, another etch boss on metal. If you have the direct flat dome light shining down, you'll have that bright field image because it reflects straight back, but this part scatters. Or if you keep your camera in the same spot but use a different light, you're now reflecting that light away, but you're capturing that scattered light in the camera. Um, Real life examples of when we use this, this is a battery cap. We, the point was to make sure this little flap here on the battery was folded down. Um, if you were gonna solve it with a coaxial light, technically you could find these dark lines, but it wouldn't be as clear as using a low angle light to make sure that that cap was folded down. You can also see a few more defects on the top that the coaxial light will hide. Um, sometimes both, both will solve it. You have bright field will solve the application and dark field will solve the application. And how we can decide between the two is um, is important. You know, which what do we recommend to our customers? What do we install in our machines? In this scenario, which would you guys recommend, the bright field or the dark field? How come? That's a great, great reason. I would agree with that. The other thing that I would say is more important and to why you're still right is the tolerance of the bottle. So this bottle, no bottle's ever gonna come through perfectly. They shuffle a little bit as they go down the line. Right here, we are very close to that text. If the bottle's just a little bit closer, that light might not illuminate that L11 and we're gonna miss reading that text. But with the dark field image, we have a lot more forgiveness in terms of how close our bottle is placed to that light as it moves down. So if both solutions work, or if you have more than one, more than one solution that works, 
The next step is what fits better into my machine, what's more forgiving in my machine, what is not going to be as intrusive in my machine. That's kind of how we think about it. Um, this is a CCS, you know, presentation, so I'm not going to get into product and all that jazz, but I am going to tell you, you know, what lights do we use to achieve these techniques? So um, bar lights are always the most flexible. They can be a low angle light. They can be a bright field light. They can kind of be whatever we need them to be in a lot of ways. So for CCS, the direct bar light we have is the LDL2. Um, we also have flood bar lights, which is the FE Flex and the HLDL3. Um, a little bit on the LDL2 bar light, just so you can kind of know the difference between each one. This is made with bullet type LEDs. They have a wide version and a narrow version available. Um, two different widths. It can be 16 millimeters and 30 millimeters. Um, these guys are great because they can be really, really small or they can be up to, I think, 500 millimeters um, if necessary and about 30 millimeters long. So they're really good for high precision applications, long story short. Um, the FE Flex 2 bar light is um, it's a great flood bar light. I don't have one up here. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but these are great because they're interchangeable. You can take the lens or the cap off, and you can adjust the emitting angle with the by adjusting the lens. You can adjust the windows, so you can adjust the um, diffusion, so you can make it more um, transparent or more diffuse, so kind of right in between, like a standard diffuser. And then it's got a multi-mode driver built in, so you can strobe it, you can um, overdrive it, and you can just have it continuously on with the adjustable intensity, all within the same light. And they can be up to, made up to four meters long if you need it to be. I don't recommend it. It's really hard to ship a four-meter light. So really, we try and do everything we can to talk you out of that option. But if you really need it and you need to pay for shipping for that, it is possible to make a light that long. Um, for the FE Flex, it can be IP67 and IP69K available, and it's made from extruded, extruded aluminum, so it's extremely easy to mount. So these are great floodlight options just because they're super flexible. They can wide angle, narrow angle, super uniform, not very uniform, kind of whatever you need. Um, other products we use to achieve the bright field or dark field is ring lights. So the LDR series has both. The LDR2 um, is just a bright, direct angle. And then there's the LA and LA1 are the low angle lights. Um, we have multi angle ring lights, which are the HPR2 and the HLDR3 and the FE ring light as well. Um, a little bit of structure differences between the LDR, LA, and LA1. So the LDR2 is just straight down, it gets your bright field image. The difference between LA and LA1 is the LEDs and the angle that they're at. So the LA has three LEDs at a slight angle, so you still get a uniform image, but you also get a little bit of light reflecting off the sample going into the camera. So you're getting um, the scattered light, but also some, some direct light versus the LA1 is um, what they call a zero, zero degree light. So it's completely parallel to your sample. So you're really just getting um, an extremely low angle light and you're just seeing that scattered reflection from your scratch to defect type of thing. Um, the HPR2 is our multi-angle diffuse spring light. This is probably like the bread and butter of a machine vision light, I would almost say. Um, this light's great because it has a lot of flexibility being multi-angle. It's got a diffusion plate that actually guides the light down based on the working distance. So if you have it really close to the sample, it kind of acts like a low angle light. But as you bring it further away, it acts more like an LDR2, kind of a bright field type of illumination, excuse me. Um, so this one's really, really useful if I'm in a lab and I don't know really where to start. I want bright field or dark field, I'll kind of just take my ring light, move it up and down and see what image gets me a better image, and then I go from there with whatever light kind of goes after that. And then the FE ring, this is very similar to flex in terms of all of its flexibility. Again, you can adjust the, um, you can adjust the lenses so you get a different emitting angle. Um, you can adjust the window so you get either a you know, super transparent window or super uniform illumination. Um, it can get polarized or line scan accessories. Um, and then it has auto stroll built in as well. So it goes 700% intensity for the first two seconds the light is on. Kind of glossed over this in EpiFlex, it does that too. So um, in the auto strobe mode, when you plug the light in and give it power, give it 24 volts, the first half a second that it's on, it's at 400% intensity. And then if you strobe it, it will always be overdriving. If you leave the 24 volts on that trigger signal, after that, that amount of time, it drops down and goes to 100% continuous mode. So you have built-in continuous mode or overdriving all within one light. Very useful. Um, the other way to achieve uh, bright field illumination is a coaxial light. There's LSE3 and the MSU. 
Um, LFV3 is kind of a standard coaxial light. One cool thing about it is you can take off the um, a, a portion of the plate of it and you can add in diffusers or polarizers or light control that come with the light. So you can kind of adjust how collimated it is. If you add light control, it's more collimated. If you have some glare you want to remove, you can put in a polarizer um, and use that as well. Or if you need it to be a little bit more diffuse, you can add a diffuser. Um, the MSU is a highly collimated light. Um, I'll talk about collimation in a few slides, but what you need to know about this light is it uses optics to create a more parallel illumination. Um, it's very small field of view, a little finicky to work with. Typically, we don't really need it. It's not really, it's kind of like when you need it, you need it, but most people don't need it. Um, but that's the different coaxial lights we have. And then for square lights, we have the FPQ3. These guys are kind of similar to the multi-angle ring lights. They have the same kind of multi or light guiding diffusion plate. Cool thing about them is they have a um, reflection plate you can add to make it kind of more like a dome light or more like a low angle light. Um, but they're great for honestly square work pieces. Square light for a square work piece is the idea for that guy. Okay, the next direction is a dome light or what we call a shadowless light. So dome light has direct reflection and diffuse reflection on the same surface. But what it ends up doing is removing the 3D structures that we have. So I kind of like to explain it as, you know, I've got my sample here, a 3D structure in the middle, right? My arm. If I shine a light from one side, I'm going to illuminate this side, but I'll get a shadow here. If I move it to the other side, I'll illuminate this side and get a shadow here. But if I put lights on both sides, I don't have a shadow anymore because there's a light illuminating both sides of it. That's kind of the idea of the dome light. It doesn't let you have a shadow because it's just illuminating your sample from all, all angles again essentially so we get another example is a contact lens so you get a lot of wrinkles showing you can't really read that barcode with just a ring light but when you have that dome light it shines down it's flattening out your image you have light coming from all sides and a much more readable print um, lights we have for this are the hpd2 the lfxv or three um, the fe flat dome or the th2-c and then we've got some perfect dome things that we don't really talk about anymore um, the HPD2 is kind of your standard standard dome light that you have. The lights, the LEDs shine up into a reflective um, a dome with a reflective material on the inside and just reflects the light down. The one thing about dome, this dome light is this is really not able to make them a custom size because they have to make like a whole um, mold for it, a whole new mold, which is really expensive. So dome lights, the only way they can be customized is making the hole bigger or adding multiple holes, something like that. But having a custom sized dome light is going to cost you a lot of money. Multiple cameras, yep. If you're looking at like a golf ball and you have a dome light in there, you got to see all the way around four lights or four cameras. Um, the other um, flat dome lights we have are the LFX3, LFXV. These are probably the coolest lights that CCS has. They are unique to CCS. Uh, what they do is there is an LED that shines across an acrylic plate that has tiny little dots they call light guiding dots. And they reflect this light down in a very dome light-esque way, um, but they don't have the same real estate that a dome light takes up, it's a big, big shell, and they don't have the problem that a lot of dome lights have on really reflective pieces of having a really dark center where the hole is for the camera. So you kind of, doesn't take up as much space. You don't have to deal with the camera hole, which traditionally you have to add a coaxial light on top to solve, which just kind of complicates it even more. Now you have to match the intensities, have you know another controller, another thing to trigger versus just one light, one, um, one image. And it honestly, it solves a lot of applications I wouldn't have been able to solve even with the dome light. It's a very, very cool light. We have it up here for later. So I recommend you guys taking it and playing around with it. Um, it's, it's unique. And then the FE flat dome, this is our flood, flood flat dome light. It's essentially a backlight with a camera hole in it. For FE Lux, it can be up to a meter by a meter square. Um, really high uniformity since it's a backlit, backlit light. Um, it's got the driver embedded, so you don't need a controller with it. You can adjust the um, different holes available. It comes at 39 millimeters, but you can make it bigger if you need, or you can add holes in other, you know, multiple holes if you're looking at a large field of view or something like that. Um, it can be IP69K available, and it can be polarized or uh, light control film. No, it's polarized available for this guy. 
Okay, the next technique is, in a really nerdy way, my favorite technique in machine vision lighting, um, but it's degree of collimation. And I love this technique because it's so um, underappreciated almost in a way. People kind of overlook it, but it actually has a lot of impact on your machine vision applications. So the degree of collimation is if you were to take your sample and have one point on your sample, the angle at which the light is hitting that point is your degree of collimation. Um, so typically we have a backlight um, and a cylindrical sample and the light is shining straight up. This is kind of what we picture a backlight to look like. So our image should look something like this. Super clear, crisp lines, easy peasy, great measurement technique. But a lot of times we get an image that looks unclear, very poor lighting. And why is this happening? Why, are, why is our image not what we expect it to be? And that's because backlights don't shine up in perfectly straight directions. They are diffuse. So the light is shining up in multiple directions, which means there is a scenario in which the light is shining up, hitting the top of our sample and being reflected into our camera. So the light is kind of coming around the edges and going up into our camera. So we're not getting that clear edge that we wanted to get. So how do we improve this image? You know, we want to get, this is what we want, this is the goal. How do we get to that? Um, the first is the um, changing the size of the light. If our, if our working distance is restricted, and that's all that we can change is how big our light is, we just want to make this angle smaller. So if we make our light smaller, we're cutting off that angle that would be able to hit the top of our sample and go into our camera. We're cutting that off, so now no matter what, this light isn't big enough to go up and reflect into the camera, so we're getting much straighter lines. Um, versus this low degree of collimation light, there definitely is going to be a scenario where the light can wrap around. If the light of or the size of our light is the you know we can't change that, but we do have play in the working distance. We can do the same thing by just increasing our working distance. So if it's really really close to it, um, then it can. If it's really close to it, then you do have that angle where it can wrap around. But the further we move away, the smaller that angle gets, the less likely it is to cause a problem. Um, kind of more examples of high degrees of collimation versus low. This is the high degree. This is taken with um, the MFU backlight, I believe, that really high collimated one. And this is taken with just a normal, normal backlight, nothing special, pretty close to it. So what I just kind of talked about, ways to change the collimation, it's kind of like a fake, fake collimation, if you will. Technically, you're changing the angle at which the light is hitting the sample, but you're not making the light any more or less parallel by just adjusting the size of the light or the light working distance. So um, we kind of call it fake collimation because it's solving the problem, but not the same way that typical collimation can. So we use light control film is kind of more like a semi or true collimation. So light control film, it can be in a horizontal or a vertical direction, and you put that on top of your light and it blocks the light coming in that direction. So if I have my light shining up everywhere, and I have a few slides that get into this later, so I won't go too much, but long story short, it um, will block the light so it comes out in a more parallel direction. And then the MFU I talked about before uses optics to make a true collimation. So there's the MSU is the optical, um, coaxial light and the MFU is our optical backlight. Um, I will say that the degree of collimation also is pays attention to front light. This is where I think it gets overlooked a lot is your light working distance. If I have my LFX-V and I put it really close to my can, it works like a dome light and I'm removing all those 3D structures. As I move it further and further away, I'm actually now highlighting those 3D structures you can see. And so depending on what I wanted to solve in this application, if I were to take my LFXV, put it you know, too far away, oh, that doesn't solve it, I toss it away, move on to the next light, I could have had the best solution, but I just didn't adjust my working distance, therefore I didn't pick the right light. So, and this works with bar lights, it works with ring, it works with anything. So before you move on to your light, if you take nothing away from this training, always adjust your working distance before you move on, just to make sure there isn't like a sweet spot that um, solves the application the way you want to solve it. Another example of this is um, batteries. Um, if you have a dent in a battery, high degree of collimation, we move a lo long working distance, we can see that defect, but as we get closer and closer, the defect disappears and it just doesn't look like there's a problem. So once again, if you had a coaxial light at the wrong light working distance, you couldn't solve the application, but really you could. 
Um, I talked a little bit about products we use for backlights. We have the TH2 is CCS's backlight. Um, we have a really thin edge lit backlight, the LSL. Um, the collimated backlight we have is the TH2 with light control film or the TH with the PM, which um, just has light control film built in. And then a big area backlight is the FE backlight. The difference between the TH2 and the LSL backlight is how the LEDs are and the thickness of it. So the TH2 has a backlit backlight, um, so all the LEDs are on the back panel and they shine up into a really good strong diffuser and it, um, it illuminates in a very uniform way. The LSL has just LEDs along the side of it and it reflects into a reflective material that shines to reflect the light up. Um, the thinness of that can be six millimeters at the smallest. So if you really have a small space, you have to get a backlight into. That's really when we recommend the LFL. But other than that, and it's a little bit more low cost because there's fewer LEDs, but the uniformity isn't great because of how it's made and there's not much to do to improve it. So unless, unless you really need a thin backlight, we'll pretty much always recommend the TH2. The FE backlight is very similar to the um, flat dome light I talked about. It can be made up a meter by a meter square, 67, 69K available, um, polarized version, or there's some zebra um, material which puts lines in it. You can put light control film in it as well. Um, so that's kind of the pro, the flood backlight that we have. Here's the light control film that I talked about. So. What it does is the parallelism of the light is improved. Um, so this is kind of the before you have that light wrapping around and here by adding the light control film, we're getting a much more straight image. So what's happening here is the light's coming up in multiple directions. If I put my horizontal film on, I'm blocking one direction from the light coming out. And then if I add my vertical on as well, then I'm only allowing the light that's more parallel to go through those two films and you get a much more um, you know, precise image, much better for um, doing measurements or anything like that. Okay, my favorite technique, collimation. Next, we're moving on from the direction of the light. That's kind of all we have there. And we're talking about the wavelength and the color. Um, before I move on, just kind of a little quick summary. The direction of your light matters if you're trying to capture bright fields, you're trying to capture dark fields, the working distance of your light, the collimation, um, and then if it's a dome light or not. So if you're trying to remove 3D texture, dome light, if you're trying to you know, find a defect or you want to capture a bright field or your dark field, scattered light or reflective light, and then just adjust that working distance, don't forget. Okay, next we have the color, the wavelength, the color. Um, I'm pretty much gonna focus on the visible light. There's a lot more non-visible light technology coming out, sphere light, hyperspectral, multispectral, all that jazz. Um, I'm not really going to touch on this in this presentation, but we do have some content about it if you guys are interested in it. Um, but for now, we'll focus on just the visible spectrum, which is about 380 nanometers to 780 nanometers, give or take each person. UV light is shorter than that. IR light, sphere light, all that jazz is longer than that. Um, so when you see the, like if you look at our catalog and you see a series, you're gonna see a graph like this on the catalog page of, you know, for example, the HPR2. And what this is showing you is the spectrum of the LEDs of the lights we have. So if you have a um, do green LED, HPR2-GR, the spectrum is gonna look like this. You're gonna have a peak at 525, but it's still gonna have some um, radiant um, intensity at, you know, 500 all the way to almost 600, right? So that's just what the spectrum of your LED is. So that's all that's showing. So long to kind of circle back to the basics, what is color? Why do we see a blue water bottle versus a pink water bottle versus an orange sweatshirt? What is, what is happening that you know, make, gives us color? And what, what it is, is we have the sunlight, which has a full spectrum, you know, vis invisible to visible to invisible again, and it's a flat spectrum. And when it shines down, this is where, you know, we I talked about light absorbing, reflecting all that jazz, that comes into play here. So a red apple will have sunlight hit it, it absorbs blue and green and reflects red. And then anything that's green absorbs red and blue and reflects green, and then blue absorbs red and green and reflects blue. So that's what we see color. Our eyes have the ability to see what light is being reflected, and that's how we see the color in our world. 
So what happens if we put a monochrome camera over everything? Everything gets a little gray. Now it's not as fun. It would be a pretty sad world to live in if it looks just like this. But we can utilize this in our machine vision applications to create contrast. So if I were to change the sunlight to be only red, we now only have red sunlight reflecting down, what's going to happen to our blue and green objects? Our red is going to continue reflecting red just as it always did, and our green and our blue are going to continue absorbing red just as they always did. So if we take that idea with our monochrome camera, we can create our contrast. So that red light reflects that red, the camera says, oh hey look, light, awesome. And then when the green and blue objects, they're just absorbing that red light. So the camera's like, mm, there's no light there. I guess there's nothing present. It's going to appear dark. So we can utilize the color of the LED with the color that we're trying to see um, in a monochrome camera to create contrast. I spoke about an apple for a reason. An apple under um, monochrome light. With the red light, the apple appears very bright. There's a lot of light reflecting off of that apple into our camera. But with the green light, it appears a lot darker because it's absorbing that green. It's not reflecting as much light, um, so it's going to appear appear darker. So if we have an example with M&Ms, if I have a white light shining, what do you think my image is going to look like? It's just kind of gray. Just a gray, sad image. If I shine a red light, how do you think my image will change with just a red light? Well, we see the red one and the yellow and the orange, but you're right, we only see the one color because we're not letting the other colors reflect the light. What about for green? Which color do we think we'll see the best? Probably green. And last but not least, blue. And so we can predict what color we're going to see by looking at the color wheel. Um, so that shows right here, but like colors or families will lighten. So when we shine red light on the M&Ms, the red one got brighter, the orange and the yellow all got bright, blue and green got dark. When we shined the green light, green and yellow, and blue lightened a little bit, but red got dark. And then when we shined blue, the blue got really bright and the yellow got really dark. So anything on the opposite side of the color wheel is going to darken. Anything that's on the, excuse me, light color or families will lighten it. Um, so this one's going to be another quiz. Um, we've got a little a barcode with a red text on it and yellow background. Here's my color wheel to kind of help you guys out. And here's what a white light looks like. Of these three, which one of them is my red light image? Left? Why do you say left? <laughs> it's middle. Yeah, so we can tell that this is the red light image because that red text in our barcode is being illuminated and reflecting off the light so much it effectively disappears with the white background and therefore it's removing that red text and uh, we're just seeing it blends in with the white background. So which one is my blue? Blue light. Right? Close. It's left. <laughs> we can tell that this one is the blue one because this yellow here gets really dark. So the yellow, blue is on the opposite side of yellow. It's extremely dark, but the red also darkens as well. And last but not least, green. And we can tell it's green because this technically did lighten, um, and green is close to yellow. So in terms of color and, you know, utilizing it, that's kind of the best way. Um, the lights that we have in that regard are full color lights. The HP R2 and the HP D2 come full color standard as an option. So you'll have one channel for red, one channel for green, and one channel for blue. Um, this is great for applications where you know you're doing like peanut butter lid caps. You're reading the date code. One's going to be red, one's going to be blue, blue, one's going to be yellow. You might need to change the wavelength to get the best image. White might not work for every color. I do this from experience, <laughs> so we needed to use a full color light. Um, to solve to solve that, so um, that's kind of the options that you have for for multiple colors. You can also just pick if it's if your sample is consistent, just pick the red light and you know go from there. But if you need multiple options, full color. Okay, next um, the technique we're talking about is the scattering and diffusion transmission. Um, so it's really going to be the UV and IR lights. 
So there's actually a scattering rate associated with different wavelengths. As you get to shorter wavelengths like UV light, they have a much higher scattering rate as it reflects off versus the longer ones. They kind of transmit through, like IR light will transmit through your sample, remain unchanged instead of like reflecting off and scattering. So lower wavelength lights will scatter more than higher wavelength lights. Um, an example of high transmission is looking at foreign material in a bottle of soy sauce. If you just use a white light to do this inspection, you're not going to know if there's anything in that bottle of soy sauce. But if we use an IR light, those wavelengths can pass through the soy sauce, remain unchanged. They reach our camera. And what's blocking the wavelengths is the foreign material on the bottom of the on the bottom of the bottle. So we can use this in a lot of you know ways. Um, we can also use it in text print. If you're looking at for a pinhole in a sample, it's right over the little um, apple seed, so it'd be really hard to see with just a standard white light. But IR light is actually able to remove that text, and we can just see that pinhole. Um, I will say, just some people aren't like, oh my god, this will solve all my problems. This is kind of a, some samples this works really well on, but it doesn't remove every ink. It really depends on the ink, the print, something like that. So it is always worth testing IR light, but sometimes it'll work really well, and sometimes that ink just doesn't, the IR light isn't enough to transmit through, and it will reflect it, and it'll look exactly the same as a white light. So it really just depends, but it is definitely a good thing to try if you're looking for, I need to make this all one color, or I need to remove this print, or something like that. Um, another example, this one's kind of fun because it's the red light and the infrared light get the same image. The red light makes the yellow and red so bright that it appears nearly white, and then the infrared light removes the text and the color altogether. Um, an example of high scattering is comparing UV light versus blue light. Um, when you have blue light, this is a scratch in a cup. When the blue light shines down, you can kind of see the scratch, but with the UV light, you can really see the difference of the scratch. Um, is it always this drastic? No, there probably is some type of fluorescence playing into this image here. So this is really just to demonstrate that there is a difference, but it's not a drastic difference that you need to consider all the time, but it's just something to know that the scattering rate will change, longer wavelengths will pass through. In terms of products we have, we have the IR, IR series. So pretty much all of our lights can come in an IR wavelength. Um, there's the dome light, flat dome light, ring, bar, and then Effie Lux. These can come at 840 or 9, 850 or 940. And then the Effie Lux lights come in like 850 wavelengths. So the bar light, the ring light, the flat, the, the flat dome light, the back light, those can all be in IR as well. And then we want to talk about um, the next topic on the wavelength is fluorescence, the fun one. So what is fluorescence? You know, this is using UV light to, um, when you go to a bowling alley that's really fun and has black lights everywhere and everyone's teeth are really white, that's fluorescence. That's when, what happens is, um, it's a phenomenon in which a wavelength of light returned from the shined object is longer than the wavelength of the shined object. Long story short, I have my sample, there's some property of my sample that when 365 nanometers hits it, it gets excited and reflects off at about 400 nanometers. So it, shot, it, it is hit with 365, reflects off higher, more than 400. So we can utilize that um, to create contrast in our images. So right now, here's what we have here is the UV light shining down and then the higher wavelength reflecting into our camera. If we use a UV cut filter, we can cut out that shined light and we only want to see the fluorescent uh, material. So back to our original image, I've cut out everything less 400 or less. I don't care about it. I don't want to see it. 365, don't get to my camera. I don't want you. 400 and above, come on in. You're welcome to the party. So we can cut off that UV light. We only see the fluorescence. So we're removing the reflection off of that metal. And now we're only looking at the fluorescence of the lubricant on the gear. So we're getting a much higher contrast image by just adding a UV cut filter. Um, UV lights, UV applications tend to be pretty easy, um, a lot, and only for the reasons a lot of times people are saying, printing with invisible ink, it you know illuminates or fluoresces at 365 nanometers. You get a light that wavelength, and you're pretty much all set. For example, this white UV filter in a white can. Um, sometimes it solves things like 
you know, glue, lubricant, stuff like that usually has some type of fluorescence as well. So if you're dealing with that kind of material, it's always worth it to try UV as well. Um, another thing to note about UV is they are, um, it's technically a hazard, hazardous illuminate or, um, wavelength, so you need to have protective, a shroud, UV protective shroud for our operator standing by, or they have to have protective gear on to cover up all their skin. So if you do use UV light, you do have to take safety precautions to make sure that it's safe for everybody standing around. No. Um, for special wavelength lights, uh, we have a UV3 series, um, ring light, bar light, line scan light. Effilux also has UV options. They say 405 and 365, but they have a really cool technology called Pure UV. So Pure UV is the idea that um, essentially, you know, I had that graph where my 365 ended, I put my filter on, and then my 400 started. Sometimes that 365 tail can kind of get a little bit into the filter, and so we're not, that filter isn't cutting out 100% of our shined light. The Pure UV technology really does, that's the point of it, it cuts out 100% of the shined light, so you have, you remove the glare on highly reflective UV samples. Um, if you're going to buy a UV light for your lab, I would recommend buying the FE Lux Pure UV light. The Pure UV technology will never hurt your application, it will always only help. So, Especially if it's for a lab, you come across a reflective sample, you're going to want the pure UV technology. If your sample's not reflective, it won't help or it won't hurt anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, but otherwise, yeah. Ring lights, bar lights, UV lights. And last but not least on the techniques of the um, direction and, you know, the physics of light is the polar polarization, polarizing. This is not last but not least, but it's close. Um, so polarizing a light. Um, we actually just did a webinar on this not too long ago, if you want to get way more into it, but I'm just going to kind of touch on the topics today. Long story short, your light shines out in a direction and it's coming around in all directions, coming out as like a circle. And what we do with the polarizers in machine vision is we want to essentially block that light from coming out. So if I add a polarizing filter that's in the horizontal direction, I'm only letting horizontal light pass through. If I turn that, if I add another filter that's in the same direction, that horizontal light is going to continue to pass through because it's exactly the same. If I take this second filter and I make it 90 degrees and I say, okay, only allow um, vertical light through, my first one only lets horizontal light through, my second one only lets vertical light through, but there is no vertical light, so it doesn't let any light through. It's kind of the idea here. But if you think about it, won't that just make our image, if there's no light getting through, how do we see anything? Um, so we get images that look like this, where we have the, you can see the LEDs here perfectly clear, but as I make my filters perpendicular to each other, it removes the, the ring LEDs, but I can still see the picture. So once again, how can I still see that picture even though I'm removing all of that light? And that's because when the light is directly reflected, it maintains that same horizontal wavelength. Well, the light that scatters goes back to the original 360 degree rotation. So we're blocking the direct light that's you know, only horizontal, and we're letting through that scattered light, which is now going back to the original state it came out of the light in. So when you're using a polarizer, before you have these hot spots, this is the direct reflection that we're seeing. This is all the scattered light here, direct reflection here. Now we're blocking that direct reflection and letting through just the scattered light. So there's actually a lot more to polarization. I've had some critiques on this slide, especially people saying I didn't get into it enough or I, what I said wasn't 100% correct, which is true, I, they're not wrong. It's just you don't really need to know much more than this for solving the machine vision application. If you're interested in doing polarizing, there's some really cool videos out there that talk about you know polarization, circular polarization and stuff like that. Um, I do recommend watching it, it's interesting stuff, but when it comes to what you're solving your machine vision applications, it's, I like, sometimes you might need to know it. Sometimes there are circular polarizations where it does come up. It's not like you don't need to know it. But for a lot of applications that you're solving that you're just trying to remove glare, this is the idea, the simple idea of how a polarizer works. Sometimes it does have to get more complicated than that. Ha, ah, got him. That actually is the... <laughs> 
Okay, this is last but not least on our, you know, four principles of lighting, the intensity. And this is just, um, the amplitude is the intensity, how bright is our LED? And all you kind of want to know is what I talked about overdriving the light. If you do need more intensity, we use the light, or we use overdriving as a way to, to get more, um, more light at different, at shorter light pulses. In terms of products we have for this, all of CCS's lights this can be overdriven. Um, most of CCS's lights can be overdriven. If you're in with a Gardasoft controller, and we have our own overdriving controller too, if you're at a point where you're overdriving the light to the maximum that it can get and you still don't have enough light, or you're at an exposure time of around 100 microseconds or less, um, overdriving probably won't be the answer for you. We do have what we call the PF series. It's called the Power Flash. And that is um, just an extremely bright series of series of light. It has a light with a dedicated controller. It can get to, I mean, I've seen it solve applications at seven, seven microseconds, which is crazy. So it's very, very, very intense light, very high exposure times. You don't need it unless you need it, but if you really have a high speed application, it's very impressive and will solve it for the most part. I haven't really seen one it hasn't solved, if I'm being honest. Um, just a few kind of bonus material, talking about different options of filters and diffusers. I think filters are also often overlooked in the machine vision industry. Um, and there's, there's three different kinds. There's a band pass filter, a long pass filter, and a polarizer. Um, so kind of what the difference between those, the band pass filter will say, we're gonna let one wavelength through essentially um, like only the blue wavelength, that same spectrum that I showed um, that you'll see with our lights, you have the same idea with a band pass filter. There's a short pass filter where it draws a line and says only things shorter than this wavelength can go through, and a long pass filter where it draws a line and says only things longer than that wavelength can go through. Um, the point of filters, kind of what do they do? They can remove ambient light. I have remove here, but really I should say reduce ambient light. If you're using just a filter alone, it will uh, reduce it to where it's probably not going to cause an issue in your machine vision system, but you'll still, it won't fully remove it. Um, they can also remove noise from other cameras. I think this is the part that really gets overlooked. Um, and then polarization as well. So when I say remove noise from other cameras, what I'm talking about is a scenario like this where I have, I'm looking at a sample and I've got two cameras and my light from each one is interfering. So I've got, you know, backlight and a front light. My backlight when it's on it interferes, but I can't take more than one image because um, I don't have enough time, for example, something like this. Instead of having two different stations, you can just put a colored light with this respective filter on that camera. So I can say, okay, I've got my, so in this scenario here, I got blue light shining down and two red light shining down and I'm getting some hot spots. This image, I've got a red bar light on and a blue bar light on, but I put on a blue filter on my camera. So now I am blocking out these red lights and I'm only looking at what that blue light is illuminating. If I were to have another camera with just the red light or with the red filter on, it would be blocking out this blue light and only looking at what the red light is illuminating. So this is great if you have multiple cameras you need to have on one station, but you don't want the light interfering with another, just match the filter with your wavelength light, and then that will be what all that camera sees. If your sample is you know, colored and a red light will change what your sample looks like, then you kind of can't do this, so it doesn't work for every application, but um, like I said, I think it's underutilized in a lot of ways. Um, another thing that it does is by using a bandpass filter, you, you can essentially create the light, um, the light color that you want out of a white light. So this is um, a white light, and there's no filter, but if they put a blue, blue bandpass filter on, you can now darken this yellow text and lighten this blue text, and you can see that date, that date code. This would be the same image if you used a white light and a blue light. So you can use the filter to create the color that you want. Um, kind of same idea here. The, the downside to using a filter is you're cutting out a lot of light, you know, if this is a spectrum of your light that you're using and you're only using 10% of it. So I wouldn't recommend a white light with the red filter installing that in a machine and running it. But I will say having that in your lab is so valuable, having a good filter kit. Because if you don't have, you know, a red, green, or blue light in every, or color in every light, but you need to make sure that a blue coaxial light is what you want, then get a white coaxial light and put a blue filter on it. You'll see what the color looks like. You'll say, okay, this is the image that I want to get. 
then you recommend that blue coaxial light. So having a good filter kit in your lab is um, a really great way to kind of get a full color light with your white light um, and then just test whatever wavelength works well. Um, polarizers, I kind of already touched on that a fair bit, but long story short, you're just removing the, um, you know, you're cutting out the wavelengths. We already we touched on that, I don't need to explain. Um, diffusers, kind of the point of diffusers is they adjust the collimation of the light. If you have a lot of glare in your sample, um, sometimes it can be just as easy as adding a diffuser. Um, I just did a webinar about glare as well. I think I already said that, so we kind of touch on this being an option. Um, but what a diffuser does is it changes the emitting angle, so widens it. So you get a much more uniform uh, illumination coming from com coming from the light. It will remove a lot of hot spots. Where I've seen this kind of happen the most is um, like metal pieces. A lot of times you can see the LEDs. You can see every LED on the metal piece. But if I use, I was using the Epilux light and I put the opaline window in it, which is like a backlight level diffuser, it removed all of those little individual hot spots and I got a much more uniform image and I could actually illuminate and get a good, good image in the end. So um, that's kind of the point of diffusers. All right, that was very fast. We went through a lot of material in an hour and 45 minutes, probably minorly overwhelming. Um, but that's all I have today for, for presentation stuff. Um, well, I guess the plan was lunch and then the hands-on portion after that. Um, so yeah, that's all I have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that one's that one's really tough. Um, there's a few kind of known things and things we thought would work but didn't work, but we haven't even found that many applications where it's like the perfect answer. Um, so short answer, no, but also like kind of. But we do have a Sphere camera and Sphere lights. So if you do think Sphere will work, you can send it to us and we'll do kind of, here's the 10 wavelengths we offer. We'll show you what it looks like for each wavelength to give you a yes or no kind of thing. but um, yeah, Sphere is an interesting technology that everybody wants to work really well, but it doesn't always work because everybody wants it to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's on YouTube. So we've been doing webinars for the past year and a half, probably, um, and they're all on our YouTube channel. We do a very similar presentation to this. There's a whole series of that. Um, and then there's um, some glare stuff, full color, more invisible wavelengths, stuff like that. There's a lot. So yeah, check out our CCS Inc. YouTube page.